Welcome and thank you all for joining. This is Bruce Booth, one of the partners at Atlas Venture, an early stage biotech focused venture capital firm. Over the next 45 minutes or so, I'm going to share the Atlas annual year in review. As in past years, there's really three parts to this. We're going to start off with a deep dive on the macro industry and then explore the biotech ecosystem and briefly close with an update on Atlas Venture. So on the macro side, I'd like to start off really by celebrating the famous Mark Twain quote that history doesn't repeat itself, but it does rhyme. As we get trapped into focusing on quarterly earnings and the daily stock prices, it's hard often to step back and put the industry in context. Context of multiple decades of progress, how we got to where we are today, and what the possible paths forward are. 2019 is a particularly good year for that. It's the end of the second decade of the 21st century. And for me personally, 20 years ago, I, I left academia for the pharmaceutical industry and have been a student of the space ever since. And so what I'd like to do is set up three signposts, 1999, 2009, and 2019, and use them to describe how the industry has changed, um, as well as some of the similarities over these periods of time. So let's flash back to 1999. 1999, it was the boom years of the dot-com era. We had sock, sock puppets, AOL acquiring Time Warner. The economy was booming under Greenspan, and we had shenanigans such as impeachment discussions down in Washington, D.C. But what was happening in the pharmaceutical industry? We had three massive mega mergers that year, three of the largest mergers of all time in our sector really beginning the process or continuing the process of reshaping the way the R&D world uh, functions as an industry. Lots of high profile biotech news. The human genome, uh, human genome was just being sequenced. Celera had initiated that work. A small, uh, small company called Celgene was relaunching a teratogenic drug in the area of cancer. There was IP lawsuits and unfortunately a tragedy in gene therapy in September of 1999, really setting the gene therapy industry and, and space um, on pause for almost the next decade. How did the stock market do during this period of time? Um, over the course of 1999, it was up over 100%, much of it coming in the latter half of the year. In anticipation of this excitement, Carl Feldbaum, the first head of bio, commented that gone are the days where biotechs traded on promise it was about real impact right now. I think we're going to hear that refrain repeatedly over the next two decades. So in the beginning of 2000, the markets actually peaked in March of 2000 and then proceeded to have eight straight quarters of declines in the NASDAQ Biotech Index. It was an incredibly challenging time, often called the nuclear winter for um, funding and starting companies. Um, and it was during this period of time that both pharma and biotech had to retool um, VCs changing their strategy during this period. Let's fast forward then through the 2000s to 2009. Great recession had just started, the failure of several banks, the financial industry was, uh, was in um, significant challenge. But in the tech world, there was increasing excitement around a number of things. Facebook and social media had passed... Uh, I actually surpassed MySpace in 2009. Companies that we now take for granted, like Uber, Square, had just gotten started. And as a parent, um, I'm surprised to say that Minecraft is only 10 years old. What happened to pharma during 2009? Well, we had another three um, significant mega mergers. And there was lots of high profile biotech news. We had the swine flu epidemic, the stimulus funding to help um, fuel not only the NIH, but lots of biotech companies. We had um, highlights of bad behavior um, from the pharmaceutical industry. And there was a publication of an interesting small phase two study in melanoma highlighting the role of immuno-oncology, really the first real demonstration of its effect in a cancer setting. It's of course ironic that in that year, Merck acquired Shearing Plow, and through that, via Organon, got a preclinical antibody known as Keytruda, now on track to become the largest oncology product of all time. 
Unfortunately, though, the stock market didn't anticipate the immune oncology excitement that year. The markets went down by 30% in the beginning through March or April, and then back up another 30% by year end, a real roller coaster. But it was an incredibly challenging time for capital formation. There was 18 to 20 straight months without a single biotech IPO. But what this period of time did do was it set a foundation for what became the 10-year bull run that we've been under. The, market, the NASDAQ biotech market has roughly gone up 500% since 2009. You can see a large, largely sideways motion over the last few years, the first market peak being in July of 2015 and a second one in August of 2018. But during this last five years, there has been an incredible amount of capital flowing into both the public markets as well as into the venture-backed biotech ecosystem that we'll come to later. Well, where does this leave us here today in, uh, in 2019? As many of you um, may know, trade war, discussions of recession, social media is omnipresent, not only in the biotech sphere, but even with Twitter coming out of places like the White House. With the Democratic primary underway, a whole host of candidates, um, as well as Trump himself, all targeting the pharmaceutical industry, uh, drug pricing and the issues surrounding the pharma industry are really front and center on the policy agenda. And what about the backdrop of industry structure? Well, again, we've had three really large mega mergers um, in, recent, in the recent period. Shire, Celgene, and Allergan are all names destined for the history books here momentarily. In terms of high-profile news, again, science um, taking the front page with CRISPR babies being born, we continue to have IP lawsuits, bad behavior being highlighted, and of course, the promise of cures in our animal models for all sorts of diseases. As you reflect on 2019 and looking back on the, the, the other two signposts of 1999 and 2009, it's hard to not see that and say the same set of issues, just different years. Are we, like Groundhog Day, experiencing the same set of challenges day in and day out, or is 2019 truly different? Well, I think there's some truth to both sides of this. And what I'd like to do is walk through six general topics and talk about the similarities and changes over the period, starting with disease burden, innovation and impact and R&D productivity, and then co close quickly around social contracts, reputation, and the drug pricing issue. So if we start with the disease burden, let's uh, look at the top causes of death over this period of time. And you can see cardio, cancer, and neurologic diseases rounding out the top three causes of death over the last 30 years. A slight change in the rate of cardiovascular death due to some of the great advances in hypertension medicines and other cardiac uh, lipid med medicines and such. But in general, these three um, remain the most significant causes of death. Death isn't everything. Suffering is obviously important. Cardio and cancer um, are at the top of the list, but then you see musculoskeletal disorders like arthritis and mental disorders like schizophrenia that, um, that, that lead to a significant amount of suffering in society. I think it's not, not, um, very noteworthy. Um, sub, substance abuse disorders at the bottom, the largest percentage change over this period of time, really highlighting the opioid epidemic. But as you step back and look at these top causes of death and suffering, what is clear is that many of them are chronic diseases. Despite massive advances in a number of orphan and genetic diseases, we continue to see um, challenges in how we address chronic, large um, primary care diseases. This is really the last frontier of how do we apply precision medicine in the clinical trials of chronic disease. You could certainly hear many folks talking about this as it relates to things like Alzheimer's, heart failure, and other major diseases. But of course, this quote was from John de Black back in 2001. This has been a multi-decade challenge of how do we really think about cracking the problem of chronic disease. I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about some of the advances on the cancer front. Here's all invasive cancers, improvement in overall five-year survivals um, out of the SEER data, uh, cancer database. A number of um, cancers we've seen nice um, improvements in, leukemia, um, lymphoma, and things like that, uh, as well as lung cancer, although starting at a horrible baseline of just 15%, we've seen nice percentage improvements 
in overall survival and of course in melanoma. But we have had challenges in things like brain cancer, colon cancer, pancreatic cancer, largely no improvement over the last few decades. So there is still lots of work to do. Why don't we shift to innovation and impact? I had the pleasure this summer of rereading lots of Ernst & Young um, annual biotech reports. These are uh, thrilling reads to get a perspective on um, the dialogue in the 1990s and early 2000s. I chuckled when I saw the cover of the 92 biotech report from promise to reality. Um, a choice quote that I found in uh, one, of the, uh, one of the issues, unlike earlier booms, when people were buying into the hope of different kinds of drug development, today it's actual results, actual products. Of course, this was from 2000. Serial entrepreneur um, Alan Auerbach, then just an analyst, um, had that uh, wonderful reflection on where things were. We continue to see this refrain, and certainly today, more than ever, we are turning the corner around real products coming out of the biotech space and the biopharma industry with new kinds of um, drug development going on. But I think in light of this quote, it's really important we remain humble about where we are today and where we are on the arc of scientific discovery. What is a good measure of innovation and impact is, of course, new FDA approvals. Here's the 30-year snapshot of new therapeutic drugs approved by the FDA. Um, of the last six years, we've had some significant approvals. We're on track for probably hitting a little over 40 this year in 2019. If we look at our signposts, some great drugs approved over this period of time. Viox obviously fell from grace, maybe coming back to life, was approved in 1999, as well as some great diabetes, epilepsy, um, and infectious disease drugs. In 2009, we saw the first IL-23 inhibitor and a number of other great programs, including some follow-ons around HPV um, and, and other great products. And then here in 2019, we've seen both first-in-class approvals as well as a number of best-in-class approvals. Um, mo most recently, the Tercafta approval in CF, giving really great hope um, in the cystic fibrosis community. One of the big changes over this 30 years is, of course, the rise of drugs targeting smaller and smaller populations, and that is indeed a major trend. But another major shift has been in the increasing diversity of the modalities. This year, we saw the second RNAi program get approved. We've seen antibodies, protein constructs, nanobodies, all being um, approved for the very first time. And so it's worth reflecting on that progression, the explosion of modalities, or as the team at Evercore calls it, the modularity um, explosion. We started in the 80s with really pills and, and injectable proteins. We added antibodies in the 90s. In the early 2000s, we started to do clinical work around oligos and virus-based therapies. And that, of course, has really exploded in recent years with messenger RNA, gene editing, microbiome, targeted protein degradation, and even digital therapies. All of these modalities are giving the R&D community and clinicians today a differentiated toolkit for being able to address different conditions. All diseases are not a nail, um, and this gives us the toolkit to be able to tailor and refine how we're thinking about making new medicines for specific conditions. Of course, as you step back and look at this, um, much of this feels like science fiction, engineering cells, engineering reality. And of course, I think some of it in 10 years, we may look back and think they were just fiction. What really matters um, and will be a really important measure of how this explosion occurred and its impact will be around how did we affect the lives of patients? A super important question as these uh, modalities explode. What is clear, though, is that the late-stage industry pipeline does have a lot of high-impact um, medicines. These are six that the Atlas team um, highlighted as hot new targets with real and compelling data. Of course, the KRAS story more recently with Amgen and Marathi both showing very nice solid tumor data. In ret fusion cancers, we've seen a number of um, great molecules entering into phase three and even onto the market around Blueprint and, of course, Loxo and Lilly. Tick 2 probably the most genetically validated autoimmune target out there. Um, some very nice phase 2 data from BMS. It's now in a large phase 3 study. I think this target is a super exciting one. Um, we are 
thrilled to have what we think may be the best in class molecule at uh, Nimbus just entering the clinic. On the lipid side, two genetically validated targets, of course, PCSK9 and ANGPTL3. With PCSK9, we've had a number of antibodies approved, but in line with that modularity explosion, we've seen great new data coming out of Alnylam and the Medicines Company with an RNAi. Similarly, with ANGPTL3, there are antibodies, RNAi, and antisense approaches for this important genetically validated lipid target. And I'd close lastly with the, uh, with the work in anemia around the hif hydroxylase and oxygen sensing pathways, where there are multiple programs in phase three, all of which have uh, published very, very compelling data around big patient impacts and the science behind these programs being, of course, the subject of a recent Nobel Prize. So these are six hot new targets that are um, approaching late stages of development in the market. But behind these, there remains a significant amount of clinical activity. The number of commercial INDs is up some 15 or 20 percent over the last five to 10 years. I think what's interesting to note, though, is if you look at the big pharma pipelines in the early, um, early part of the clinic, they have dropped by roughly 24 percent. And so the combination of this highlights the increasing and important role that small and mid-cap biotech companies are actually playing in the early clinical development of novel medicines. One of the areas in recent years that biotechs have really outperformed is in the area of precision medicine. So targeted kinase inhibitors in different forms of cancer going after specific mutations. Here are um, seven companies, all of which have developed multiple drugs or are developing drugs against these areas um, and advancing the, the precision medicine component of uh, cancer therapy. I think of note in addition to these seven and of course blueprint, but with these seven, they've had um, significant interest from pharma leading to eventual acquisitions. And so all of these were acquired, really bringing the cycle um, full circle around innovation starting, being developed and, and discovered and developed in early smaller biotech companies, and then being acquired by larger pharmaceutical companies. This is a exciting area of precision medicine, but if we take precision medicine to the extreme, that's the last area around innovation and impact I'd like to mention, which is the N of one therapies. We've heard about um, these now, even um, guidance around this from the FDA, but Bloomberg covered this just recently around patients and their families being mobilized to make therapies for single individuals. Take Mila in the upper right-hand corner. This girl suffers from a disease called Batten's disease, and her physician designed an oligo, an antisense oligo, um, to essentially treat her condition. Published in the New England Journal of Medicine, some very nice um, early data there suggesting it's having impact on some of the severe symptoms. Take um, in the bottom right hand corner Maxwell Freed, the son of very good friends of mine um, who was born with a very rare mutation that leads to severe pediatric epilepsies. They are mobilizing to develop a gene therapy for their child. None of this would be possible without that wonderful modularity explosion and really the advancing of different kind of tools to address different patients' needs. These are truly inspiring stories about applying these novel new medicines and technologies to solving patient needs. As you step back from the specific and very inspirational stories and roll it up to the industry level, we should shift to R&D productivity. All of you are familiar with Eroom's law, the inverse of Moore's law around the um, output of the industry per dollar spent. This has been a multi-decade R&D productivity challenge. Um, here's a quote from the former head of uh, R&D at Lilly about funding new technologies, funding more science in a rational way, and yet it continues um, to decline in overall productivity. Biology is incredibly complicated. I think one of the things that is a, um, a silver lining in recent years has been that this curve looks like it has flattened out. There is a significant and meaningful and statistical change in the overall slope of this curve. Um, BCG is about to publish some work around this front that may give an indication that the productivity decline has, uh, has slowed, if not abated. But let's explore the components of R&D productivity. There's really three features to this, risk, 
cost, and time. On the risk front, this is an inescapable reality of our business. Most programs fail. Here's a view of phase two to launch, so the first time a drug actually touches a patient to launch, five out of six drug programs fail to make it through phase two and phase three to approval. This year is no different. We've had a number of late stage failures. Um, I guess I should uh, um, question whether Biogen's aducanumab is a failure. It certainly failed a futility study, um, but may have been resurrected. Um, we'll find out here shortly. But we've had other failures in PSP with a tau antibody. We had inflammation, NASH, cancer, and even in genetic um, gene therapies, we've seen large late stage failures where you'd expect replacing a gene would work, but even that can have challenges. Biology is incredibly challenging. One of the things I'd like to call attention to though is the curve from the mid 90s to 2010 period, really a decline in productivity or in a decline in your survival rate from roughly 20% down to close to 10 or 12%. What was the big driver behind this decline? Well, it was actually predicted back in 2001. A wonderful report called The Fruits of Genomics highlighted that as the human genome was being sequenced and as we started to work on much less well-validated targets, um, the overall risk profile of these programs was going to increase. Indeed, that's what happened. Um, indigestion and failure rates um, increased. Cost went up throughout that period of time. I think as you reflect on um, what's happening today in the industry. Some say, you know, the low-hanging fruit has been picked. That's the reason why we have the challenge. I actually disagree with this general point. I think there are an abundant number of wonderful new targets that are being genetically validated across the whole range of different diseases. We certainly have um, a great set of tools now to go after those different kinds of targets. Um, the word undruggable may no, may, longer, may no longer be relevant. But one of the bigger challenges we do have um, is the better than the Beatles problem that uh, Scannell and others um, characterized back in 2012. This problem is one that if every new musician, when they came up with a new, with a new song, had to beat the Beatles, it would be an incredibly high bar for every new musician. Well, that's the, the challenge that um, new biopharma companies and new biopharma programs face as they work against past standards of care. It's an incredible challenge as the corpus of new drugs um, and larger and larger armamentarium of, of drugs um, becomes what you have to compete against. But it's not just the past that we're competing against, it's actually also the present. And the hyper-competition problem really has increased the overall risk profile. To give you an example of that, every drug class has always had competition in it. Here are some of the really large old drug classes um, approved in the 80s and 90s, you can see between 5 and 20 different active ingredient, active agents were approved in each of those classes. But today we're seeing between 20 and 50 programs in development or approaching approval across all of the major new classes. And the pace at which they are getting approved, first mover advantage is almost gone. This is really a change in the risk profile from just target and biology risk to a huge market and differentiation risk aspect. But if that's a summary of where risk is, how are we doing on the cost side of the equation? As you might expect, real inflation adjusted costs have gone up dramatically in phase one, phase two, and phase three. This looks at the mean and median out of the uh, um, 30 years of work from the Tufts Center. Um, these costs have increased not only because trials are more complicated, there are more endpoints, there's more sophisticated technologies being used to measure biomarkers and imaging and other things, but we also operate inside of a healthcare system, largely here in the U.S., which uh, has also seen significant increases in terms of provider services, clinical access, and such. And so I do not see these um, out-of-pocket direct cost to fund clinical studies as abating anytime soon. If we shift then to the last dimension of productivity, which is time, I think this is the one that hasn't changed as much as we'd like to believe. This integrates some data from the KMR group as well as um, Clarivate and CMR, um, looking at time in discovery and time in development. I think what's striking is, in particular, time in discovery. It's roughly four years from screen to a development candidate, and this has held true over the last 20 to 25 years. 
um, despite all of the um, all of the CPU power that we have put in through computation, um, through new technologies, through new approaches for better profiling, and certainly a much greater level of analytical and bioinformatics support, it still hasn't fundamentally altered that time frame. The the four years to screen from screen to development candidate and the ten years from preclinical approval obviously mean these. The, the challenge of developing drugs in this background is still, you know, more than a dozen years typically to go from start to approval. And so that's a snapshot of where things are on risk, cost, and time and R&D productivity. I'm actually very excited about the impact of genetically validated targets and better, um, more, more precedented and validated um, technologies to be able to be applied on the risk dimension. Um, but it will be interesting to see how these all aggregate into R&D productivity over the next few years. If we shift then um, to the social contract, I'd like to talk about this um, and the, the issue we've had for over 30 years around the loss of the monopoly pricing model to generics. This has been an important part of our ecosystem for decades and a significant um, source of worry and concern in 99, 8% of the industry's overall revenues were at risk. Um, it moved up in 2009, and more recently, it's roughly 8 to 10%, roughly $40 billion in sales. In 99, you can think back, it was Prozac and Claritin. In 2009, it was you know, Zocor and Lipitor. In 2019, we're talking about Revlimid. We're talking about uh, Lyrica. These are important large drugs, leaving a um, today a $40 billion dollar potential um, aggregate amount of sales at risk of going down by 80 to 90 percent over the course of the next few years. And replacing that lost revenue is certainly a challenge. It leads to changes in industry structure and M&A, but most importantly, it creates room in society's healthcare budget and is part of that contract that we have with society. This is where um, I think we have failed as an industry, is extending that social contract into the area of biosimilars, we still do not have interchangeable generic biologics. This is something we've talked about for several decades. This is an analyst report from 2001 called Generic Biologics the Next Frontier. Biopartners, company in uh, Europe, I almost invested in this company back in 2004, um, really to advance the whole area of biosimilars and biogenerics, unfortunately. Um, uh, I guess, fortunately, I didn't invest. That space has been an incredibly challenging one um, to realize returns and, frankly, to realize the wonderful promise of impact that those could have, largely because incumbents and their lawyers have created significant barriers to getting these approved through regulatory agencies and getting onto the market. And so how big of a challenge is this? Just to put one lens on it, I looked at the top 15 drugs in each of our um, major periods and what percent of the sales from those drugs came from biologics. And it's gone from 10 to close to 70% of the, of the top 15 sales are now biologics. This obviously reflects the, the fantastic impact that antibody therapies in particular have had on medicine, but it also reflects their staying power. If you look at the median age since um, from approval um, to, to um, the, the time period in 1999, it was nine years for the average biologic. Today, it's 15. Once they enter the top 15 list, most of these drugs never leave. In fact, four of today's top 15 drugs were approved over 20 years ago, and all are biologics. Fundamentally, this is a failure of the social contract. This, of course, has led to challenges around our industry reputation. Let's talk about that for a moment. In uh, late, late part of the summer, there was a report out by the Gallup saying that um, farm industry was the worst ever, and that indeed is true if you look at um, different cuts of this data. But it's fair to say we have had a neutral to negative view of pharma over the last 20 years. Really, since the first poll was done in 2001, 60% were neutral or negative about the pharmaceutical industry. This has been an ongoing perennial challenge, quoting from 1990, um, that pharma is both hero and villain. And that is the challenge we face. And we have failed to s sort of step up and own 
how we message the, imp the positive impact that we can have. In addition, I'd argue that we've had a whole bunch of self-inflicted wounds, largely from hubris about our uh, position in the industry. We have the opioid crisis. You know, we had IP issues around um, engaging with the Mohawk Indian tribe. We've had challenges around data manipulation um, in the press, getting ac or access issues into politics. And even Epstein has cultivated connections to many of the top scientists who are um, our advisors and in our networks, um, really tainting the overall industry. Of course, beyond this, we have the, the major issue around drug pricing. Roy Vagelos, um, in 1991, had this editorial in Science, are prescription drug prices high, making the argument that indeed they weren't, that impact that we were having on society and on medicine and on patients was super important. But this has been an issue for the last 30 plus years. You know, when Genzyme launched the first DRT in 1991, it was the equivalent of $550,000 in inflation adjusted dollars, you know, 19, uh, 2019 dollars. Similarly, when Embro launched um, in the late, late 90s, roughly 19 to 20 thousand dollars in today's um, inflation adjusted uh, 2019 figures. These were amidst huge public outcry of pricing scandals. This has been a constant issue that our industry has had to battle. And the four main levers that were talked about in the 1990s and continue to be talked about today are things like drug importation, direct negotiation, reference pricing to the rest of the developed world, and the complexity of the U.S. system around rebates and the role of uh, private insurance middlemen and such um, as a burden to the U.S. system. I think it's interesting to reflect in 1999, um, Bernie Sanders actually took a group of Vermont um, citizens across the border in a bus to buy drugs in Canada. And so this has been a major issue for several decades, and the fact that we're talking about it now is because of a failure to step up around this issue, not only to manage our own pricing expectations, um, but also to communicate around value. And here I'll um, use old Gensma, the uh, first gene therapy for SMA, as an example. First $2 million therapy, but looks like it effectively cures disease. And even ICER put within one of their frameworks, this was on the upper boundary of a cost-effective therapy because it replaces a lifetime of cost dramatically altering the quality of life for these patients and that the payment is spread over five years in effectively a pay for performance model. And so this is a great example of being able to say when you have significant impact on patients, you can think about value-based pricing models um, that achieve very um, attractive overall rates of return for investors and for pharma companies, but importantly, really deliver value to patients and society. And so as we step back um, and reflect on these six, I think you'll agree that much of this um, rhymes over the last 30 years. If you reflect on the context for where we've been the last 20 or 30 years and how we got to where we are, I'm actually super excited about the various paths forward. Yes, we have our challenges, but there is a lot of reasons to be optimistic about the innovation, impact, and productivity coming down the pipeline in both pharma and biotech. And so that's a great point then to segue into the overall um, biotech ecosystem. And I'd like to start, um, as I did before, with some of those signposts. So let's uh, jump into 1999 biotech. Um, it was certainly an exciting time. There were some new startups. Interesting to note, Galapagos, the subject of a fantastic deal with Gilead this year, um, was founded in that year, uh, as was Ironwood and Pharmacet. Pharmacet, of course, being the discoverer of um, Sovaldi, the, uh, the hugely impactful HCV medicine. Um, there were a number of great IPOs that year. Biomarin of note, Tularic, later acquired um, by Amgen. And some large VC rounds were done that year. Um, interesting to note, all three of these effectively started to advance anti-infective medicines, um, something that uh, is particularly challenging here today. I'll call attention on the big deal front because these deals really started to reshape the interplay between biotech and pharma. 
Um, Centacor and Agaron were both acquired by larger pharmaceutical companies, giving them significant biotech footprints in antibodies and computer-aided drug design. And then Millennium, which at the time was more of a gene information company, buying Leukocyte to forward integrate into drug discovery and development, of course, in that acquisition, um, almost by serendipity, getting a hold of Velcade and really becoming a huge and significant player, reshaped reshaping the Cambridge biotech ecosystem. And so if we jump then forward to 2009, um, this was a more challenging time from an IPO perspective. Several of those IPOs, I think there were only four that year, um, are ones that most of us have never heard of. A lot of new startups were, were actually put in place that year, Kite being one of those high profile players. Bluebird was a repositioning from genetics into, uh, into Bluebird and relaunching in that year. Some huge VC rounds were done. Um, these three companies all raised significant amounts in the private markets and then went on to uh, raise significant amounts in the public markets in the next few years. Um, what's interesting to note is the challenges of um, R&D and the markets they were operating in. All three of these now trade below the prices of those large VC rounds back in 2009. So highlighting that even capitalization and strong capitalization can't protect you from some of the challenges in R&D. And on the big deal front, I'll really just call attention to one, which as uh, Jeff Porges highlighted, is probably the greatest, most high impact acquisition of a biotech company ever, which was BMS's purchase of Metarex for a little over 2 billion, which brought Opdivo and a number of other programs, um, antibody programs and capabilities into um, Bristol Myers. And so if we jump here to um, 2019, I am not going to stand here and tell you what the best startups and best IPOs and best M&A events were for the year. I think only time can tell that. But what I will do is take you through the, th the four C's of the startup ecosystem around capital, collaboration, community, and culture. And so if we talk about capital and venture capital flows, here's a chart that looks at quarterly f um, venture capital funding. Um, into U.S.-based biopharmaceutical companies, you can see that the last eight quarters or so are the eight largest quarters of all time in the history of our industry. Really significant amount of capital flowing here. We're, of course, down from where we were in 2018, but still a significant amount of capital. Um, one of the big um, reasons for that drop has actually been the decline of foreign investors investing in the U.S., in particular China and Asia-based funds have reduced their overall investing activity in the U.S. by 70 or 80 percent, according to some recent banking reports, um, and that has taken a billion or so out of the early stage um, venture capital funding here in the United States. Even amidst this funding, though, and a theme that I have talked about in the past, the number of new startups is roughly constrained. Um, here's a snapshot of the number of new startups getting first financings in the U.S. It's been relatively flat over the last five plus years, really, um, I think, in spite of the huge amount of capital coming in to the ecosystem. Um, we get a lot of questions about why this is. Fundamentally, I think it's because the venture creation model has changed. If we think about venture creation back in the 1990s and early 2000s, it was really an entrepreneur-led um, experience, a standalone startup, independent of its investors, built a pitch deck, went around and shopped it to different VCs who provided arm's length capital, um, in some ways creating the misalignment between founder and investor around uh, disciplined decision making. That has shifted to a much more in-house venture creation model. This is one that we at Atlas have been doing for the last 10 plus years, and certainly most early stage funds now have some component of this, where the founding of the company and the found role of founding investors um, is very close to the entrepreneur. There's often an incubation model and an entrepreneur in residence approach to this, where we aggregate talent and work on building and launching companies where the fundraising, at least the initial fundraising, is really baked into the DNA of these companies from the start. And the alignment around decision-making is, uh, is, I think, quite positive. But that experience um, of venture creation is one that isn't fundamentally scalable. Um, even a firm like Atlas is only able to launch six or seven new companies a year, um, and this is in line with many of the other um, significant uh, venture creation early stage biotech firms. And so it's hard to move the needle in overall numbers of startups in this model.
One of the things that has moved the needle, though, is uh, the increasing amount of funding that goes into each of these startups. Um, a big contributor to that is because venture capital funds are larger at both the average and median raised in the different years. There on the chart on the left, you can see we've effectively doubled the size of um, biotech-oriented venture capital funds, and we've seen more investors engaging in biotech rounds. And so that chart there around active investors, they're doing two or more biotech financings a year, has also doubled over the last seven or eight years. Um, this includes endowments, family offices, um, and your more non-traditional, um, non-venture capital investors as well. But the combination of bigger funds and more active investors has, of course, led to an average funding per round that has largely doubled over the last five plus years. Um, this is a very significant trend, and you can see as the funding really spiked in 2018 is where you see this effect. Another way of looking at this is the number of mega rounds that have been done in the industry. These are rounds north of $100 million. Um, they used to be you know, just a small number of these, um, five or six per year. Um, today, there are over 50 of these last year and likely similarly this year. Really significant capitalizations. Here's a, um, a table of 10 of these um, that have happened in the last uh, 12 months or so. Many of the companies that are raising capital like this um, have broad portfolios. They're advancing real you know, p potential medicines, and they need this kind of capital to fuel their growth. But I would argue a number of them um, are significantly capitalized early stage science projects, and it remains to be seen whether they'll be able to be disciplined in their deployment of that capital in the face of the challenges of early stage science. So we shift from the funding arena into the public markets and the IPOs. This is a pair of charts that look at the number of biotech IPOs as well as funding. And I think the one um, major theme that jumps out is that there's 10 years since we've had a dry quarter for IPOs. Really a very steady process, of course, with a spike in 2014 and 15, and again in 2018 and early 2019, we've seen significant um, IPO activity but it has been a relatively open window during that period of time as contrasted with the past where it was really feast or famine and you'd go multiple quarters often without having um, any biotech offerings. Of course, um, a big part of this has been the nature of the funding environment. And so the amount of private capital going into these companies has increased over the last few years, um, almost doubling at both the median and the average. The IPO offerings themselves are also up. They're up by 20 to 20 to 30 percent over that same period. And these two things, combined with a more accommodating environment, have really led to post-IPO valuations that have never been as high um, as this in the in the history of the industry. We're seeing median IPO valuations this year north of 400 million. And so when you hear um, folks complaining about the IPO market today, about the tightening nature of it and such, um, really by all historic measures of valuation, we are in an incredibly positive, accommodating environment. Certainly challenging if you've raised lots of private capital, um, but the overall valuation market, you know, a $400 million valuation five years ago was considered very rare and just the most premium companies were able to achieve that. And that is certainly not the case here today with the median and average well north of 400 million. But of course, it's not just um, the valuation you go out at, it's your post-market performance that's important. And like most IPO classes, this one has seen a significant dispersion in post-offering performance, roughly half of the class going up and half um, a breaking issue. This is not any different than um, any of the IPO classes that I've looked at over the last 10 or 15 years. This is a very common dispersion in overall performance. Um, one of the questions that I often get is, well, if you raised more at higher valuations, are you insulated from some of these changes, uh, some of these fluctuations? And that is indeed not the case. And so here's a chart that looks at post-money valuation at IPO on the x-axis and stock price performance. And you can see this scatter plot for all of the IPOs since 2015 with really no trend line um, noticeable at all. Of course, as you look at the aggregate nature of this, roughly um, one out of every um, six or seven have doubled in their IPO price, um, you know, 17%. And, you know, three out of five 
have broken issue and remain trading at uh, um, below their initial offering price. And so this reflects the significant dispersion that you see in uh, the small cap um, biotech universe following their IPOs. One of the things that does seem to be predictive, at least of near-term performance, is the type of syndicate you enter your IPO um, environment with. And this gets to the conversation around crossovers. And so some work from William Blair shows that if you have a crossover in your last private round, um, you typically go out at a higher valuation, you price within range more frequently, and your aftermarket performance, at least for the last 40 offerings that um, these data reflect, um, you know, was significantly higher than if you did not have crossover support in your offering. And so that would suggest um, that you definitely want to have crossovers involved. But I think it would be remiss to think about crossovers all as long-term investors. A number of them take a much more short-term view. This is work out of Goldman. The top 12 most active crossover investors in rounds over the last six years there on the left. If you just look at the percentage of IPOs that they either reduce or exit within just 12 months, um, it's fairly significant, roughly 40% on average. And take investor 10, 100% of their positions were reduced or sold. Uh, within 12 months. I can assure you that most VCs have not exited their positions after just 12 months. And so as a final summary slide on the capital markets, I'd like to look at the really the macro view of overall fund flows. And so if you take the trailing 12 month venture funding in purple, IPO funding in orange, and follow on public market funding in yellow, over the last 10 years, what you see is two giant waves. Of course, that peaking out in um, the summer of 2015, a huge wave of capital coming through. And there on the right-hand side in 2018, another gigantic wave. And I'm not an economist, but my understanding is that when you have lots of capital flowing in, um, it should um, reduce overall returns. And so if we look at this and we then overlay the forward 12-month XBI returns, the XBI being the biotech index more, um, uh, more capturing the small and mid-cap market space, you see exactly that. And so forward 12-month returns, very strong in the beginning of this period, really significant. And then a decline in returns with the flood of capital um, in 2015 and then again in 2018. And so for me, as I step back and look at this, it's a good reminder to remain disciplined in the face of changes to capital flows, especially um, in the more frothy environments. And so that's a wrap on the capital markets. What about the um, M&A side of things? As an early investor, I like to look at R&D stage biotech M&A. Um, and looking at the data this way in 2015 and 18, really significant years for R&D stage uh, acquisitions, both in the public and private arenas. This year, we're on track for 25 to $30 billion of activity, a very significant amount, especially when you think that much of this then recycles back into um, earlier stage uh, biotech companies. Here's a snapshot of um, 10 of the deals, the, the top um, public and private um, M&A deals of the year. I think one of the things that I like about this list is that it covers lots of different disease areas. Of course, you have target on oncology, but you also have autoimmune, CNS, and a number of other, um, even metabolic diseases across this group. I think the other thing to note is that pharma is using M&A to acquire really new novel modalities. Coming back to that modality modularity explosion referred to earlier, you see gene and cell therapies on here of significance, you know, CRISPR-based uh, technologies and such. In addition to M&A, Pharma has been using collaborations and shifting to collaborations um, has been using these as a tool to get access to new um, innovative technologies. These are some of the largest collaborations done of the year. And what you can see there on the right hand side in purple is that beyond some of the broad and creative alliances at Galapagos and Royvant, a number of the others of these are about new modalities. So partnerships for RNAi, gene vectorized antibodies using small molecules to affect RNA, um, you know, protein-based biologics, targeted protein degradation, um, tools which with, you know, using collaborations as a tool to be able to access some of these new exciting modalities.
One of the things that worries me on the M&A and collaboration front is, of course, the digestion problem. Um, six of the most active deal makers in the last five years or so um, are in the midst of acquiring and integrating. We just recently saw the uh, Celgene um, acquisition close. Um, Takeda is busy um, integrating Shire, and uh, um, soon Allergan will be integrated into AbbVie. Um, to give you a reflection of their their activity level, if you just look at the forty billion or so in overall BioBuck private M and A deals um, over the last five years, these six were involved in fifty percent of the value, and so really significant relative to the other top thirty or so um, pharma companies. And hopefully, we will see other firms step up in creative and exciting ways. Vertex has obviously initiated some of that this year with a number of interesting both M&A events and collaborations, and we're certainly hopeful that this type of uh, trend continues moving forward. And so that's a bit on the capital and collaboration side. Let me shift to the community and the community side, and what I mean by that is talent. The war for talent in the startup environment is huge. As of right now, uh, or as of last year, we had 160,000 R&D jobs in um, the United States. Um, this is up significantly from 10 years ago. Um, companies today, 40% of them are taking aggressive hiring postures, really building out their teams significantly. Um, and relatively few are feeling any sense of belt tightening around their hiring sentiment. And then lastly, turnover rates are huge in our industry. Roughly one out of every five employees in the Boston market um, leaves its biotech, leaves a biotech company every year. Um, not that far behind is the rest of the United States. I was actually surprised that the Delta wasn't larger here, given the um, hot and competitive nature to the Boston ecosystem. You know, roughly one out of every eight is a voluntary change. Um, uh, moving on to better opportunities or better titles and better salaries. And so it is an incredibly challenging um, overall market for both attracting and retaining talent. As a venture investor and board member, I focus most of my attention on C-level hires, um, looking at executives. And Im importantly, I'd say the market for experienced executives is incredibly challenging. Um, and by experienced executives, those are ones that have decades of um, history in our industry, whether it be in pharma roles or biotech roles. We're often asked, um, you know, what's the profile of those? The reality is a lot of them have gray hair. If you look at the IPOs um, from 2012 to 2017 and the age of the CEO at IPO, more than half of these CEOs are members of AARP. They, uh, you know, clearly have a bit of gray hair, they have experience, they have um, both R&D and business um, backgrounds into these roles. Interestingly, at IPO, the median tenure of a CEO is roughly three and a half years. And so they're, they're often joining these companies to help take them to the next phase. And I think an important note is a lot of them are first time CEOs. Certainly in the last 10 Atlas IPOs, eight out of 10 are first time CEOs in the role. And I think that actually reflects a similar um, distribution in the, uh, in the overall industry. And so taking bets around seasoned but first-time CEOs is something that many of us are doing in the industry um, in this incredibly challenging war for talent. And so lastly, I want to close the, with the four C's around culture, a super important part of this. If you haven't read um, Gary Pisano's Harvard Business Review piece called The Hard Truth About Innovative Cultures, you should. It really um, captures the essence of innovation um, and the fact that innovative cultures aren't necessarily nice. I'll highlight these five features. A tolerance for failure, but no tolerance for incompetence. You need to be willing to experiment, um, but be highly disciplined about those experiments and what you do with them. A safe, nice place, but be brutally candid in your feedback. Be a team-based collaborative culture, but hold individuals truly accountable, and then have a flat merit, you know, meritocracy-oriented leadership approach. Now, these five things are um, great examples of innovative attributes across big companies and small companies. I'd argue in big companies, they're very hard to capture. In small companies, we at Atlas do spend a lot of time trying to engineer these cultural attributes 
right into the DNA of the startups as we create them. Sometimes we're more successful at doing that than others, but it is truly an important part of culture and an important part of what we focus on here at Atlas. And so that's actually a great um, segue then to close out on uh, the biotech section of this and give you a brief update on um, what's been going on at Atlas Venture. As a, um, a first step in that, I just want to um, remind, remind you of the six tenets of Atlas's strategy. We are a seed-led, science-first venture capital firm. We focus purely on therapeutics in that early stage, really taking science from around the world and building companies, typically locally, um, often incubating in our office. And um, very in, last, but very importantly, our, our mission of doing well by doing good. The real double bottom line of biotech investing around having meaningful impact on patients. And so I'd like to talk about three things in this Atlas section. One, a little bit of historic context, give you an update on the portfolio, and then close out with um, some thoughts about the Atlas community. And so for historic context and continuing the theme around the, uh, the signposts, let's look at what, what has happened to Atlas over the last 30 years or so. Over that period, we raised 10 funds, um, and we've changed dramatically both in terms of our geography and our um, industry focus. In terms of geography, we went from having offices um, in both the U.S. and Europe to consolidating just into Cambridge by 2010. Um, we had, in the early years, a very diverse tech and life science, more broadly, um, sector footprint. And we focused, um, by 2010, really down into biotech, and then by fund, by fund 10 in 2014, really a pure play biotech-only strategy as a firm. As we look at this uh, period of time, let's take a quick snapshot into 1999. There's a picture of uh, a young Jean-Francois. Um, who really set up the practice in the 90s. Um, we raised three very large funds during that period of time. It was incredibly exciting. Overall market in 99 and 2000, there were 16 life science IPOs that Atlas participated in. Five of them are noted here. Some names that uh, I'm sure many of you are familiar with, you know, Actilio and Exelixis, Morphosis, and others. And a number of new startups came out of that uh, period of time. Um, I highlight Achilleon on here in 2000, obviously just recently um, acquired, and also Almylum really um, formed in that challenging period of time in 2002, and here we are today, um, 17 years later, with two um, new drug approvals. Really, really exciting. If we shift then to um, 2009, a very different market environment than 1999. Really no IPOs to speak of. Certainly Atlas did not participate in any, but we did have three M&A exits. Um, those uh, three across the broad range of diseases in anti-infectives, oncology, as well as neuroscience, and several new uh, startups, um, notable ones being Nimbus was set up in May of um, 2009. Obviously has been uh, successful at deploying a computer-aided drug design strategy. Um, and then Arteus, which came out of our Atlas Venture Development Corp initiative. Um, we partnered with Eli Lilly around a migraine antibody that became Engality, and just earlier this year sold that royalty to, uh, to Royalty Pharma. And so very successful uh, startups came out of this period of time. And what about in uh, 2019? We've had four exits so far this year. Um, IFM and Rodan were both acquired, or an IFM subsidiary. Um, and Rodan were both acquired. We had two IPOs with Akiro and Bicycle, and we've launched a number of startups into the Series A phase. Um, all of these are doing interesting um, novel um, areas of biology, um, and we have a number of stealth companies behind these. We did also close the Atlas Venture Opportunity Fund earlier in the year as a growth, uh, growth equity vehicle to really power up um, some of our platform stories and drive success into the uh, uh, public markets. The, if you step back from this and you think about how has um, Atlas performed relative to the industry, you know, if we look at the eight funds that are maturing at this point, funds three through funds 10, um, Atlas has significantly outperformed. We looked at a, um, a public market equivalent analysis and effectively our biotech strategy has outperformed major market indices, including biotech indices across every fund vintage. Um, interestingly, the broader life science investments were actually less successful. 
um, diagnostics, med tech tools, reformulations and such. Um, and it's actually because of that um, appreciation that those were more challenging for us, we exclusively focused on early stage therapeutic biotech investing as of 2010. Um, you may ask about sort of how the distribution of returns looks like within this historic context. If you take the last 10 years of all of the therapeutic exits in the industry for all venture capital and biopharma only, what you'll see on the left is a percent of financings, 55 to 65 percent of deals lose money um, and a slightly less percentage of capital there on the right hand side um, with roughly 10 to 12 to 15 percent being 5x or above returning deals, both in the industry and for biopharma only. If we overlay Atlas's um, performance over that period of time, we have lower loss ratios, both on a percent of financings and uh, capital weighted. But importantly, roughly 30 percent of our deals have ended up exiting um, at north of a 5x overall return. So a very attractive profile and that has certainly driven some of the uh, historic outperformance. If we shift then from um, returns and a historic perspective to our um, portfolio, here's a snapshot of our portfolio mix at Atlas uh, relative to the industry going across disease areas. We are roughly market weight in most categories with a slight emphasis in rare disease and immunology um, and a slightly lower emphasis on things like cardiovascular and metabolic disease. In terms of modalities, um, again, we participate in every major modality, as you might expect, from small molecules and antibodies, but importantly are overweight some of those novel new modalities, as you might expect, in things like cell and gene therapies, as well as oligonucleotide therapies. I think as you look at these two snapshots, it's fair to say that we are both disease area and modality agnostic, and really do focus on a science-first, patient-centric approach to investing. What's happened to the Atlas Pharma pipeline? This was the pharma pipeline for 120 or 30 or so of the projects in our portfolio um, back in 2016. If you look at the progression to 2019, I'll call attention to two things. One, an increase in the number of discovery programs. This reflects a number of the broad platform companies that we've started and the um, launching of lots of new discovery projects. But importantly, moving into the clinic, we now have over 30 um, phase one and phase two programs active um, in our portfolio. It's been a really exciting time to watch those not only enter the clinic, but progress. I'll call attention to five pieces of uh, um, new clinical news that happened this year. Um, first, you know, Avro announced a 87% reduction in substrate in the kidney, the toxic substrate that accumulates in Fabry disease. Really an exciting time for that cell and gene therapy story. Translate Bio also had some very nice um, data in um, cystic fibrosis in lung with inhaled messenger RNA therapy, replacing uh, the CFTR gene. Um, Rodan, uh, the subject of a recent acquisition with Alchemies, announced the positive phase one data showing it was a safe and well-tolerated and um, pharmacologically active agent um, for neurologic diseases. Magenta, with its uh, 456 cell therapy, some very nice early efficacy in cerebral ALD, a rare orphan disease, um, but early trial data definitely gets us excited about the potential for that product. And then lastly, Sparrow moved its um, novel antibiotic into phase three on the basis of some very nice early stage data. So we are excited about the clinical progress and we're looking forward to a lot more clinical news here in, uh, in 2020. Other uh, things to note would be around partnerships. We've had a number of uh, great partnerships in the portfolio this year. First, Novartis um, and IFM partnered around some autoimmune targets in uh, Seagas and Sting. Um, we also had a very large multi-target deal get set up between Chimera um, a leading player in the targeted protein degradation space, and Vertex. And then lastly, we had three deals struck with Celgene, actually all closing after the um, BMS acquisition was announced. Um, we had a um, collaboration with Obsidian and Kine, as well as Nimbus, all get announced here in 2019. And so Celgene will be uh, deeply missed, and hopefully uh, other companies can step up into their, uh, into their big footprints.
beyond partnerships, which of course bring both capital and capabilities. We've done a number of other uh, equity financings. Here are um, five of the uh, more notable um, private financings that we've done um, from some really early companies that uh, closed seed and A rounds like Coro and Videri in areas of genetic, um, genetic diseases and gene therapies. Um, and then a number of Series A uh, and Series B rounds as well. Shifting though to um, the Atlas team and lastly, the community side of the story. Um, these are the 22 team members. It's a real privilege to be a part of this group um, and a uh, uh, really great culture and great team. I'll call attention to a few of the new additions. Andre Demella joined us um, to lead that war for talent for us around attracting and retaining um, great executives for our portfolio, Sharon Morani joined really to run uh, seed operations to help us be more efficient in how we incubate and launch companies. And then uh, Chelsea and Yerni both joined our investment team over the last uh, six to 12 months or so. And so this is the team. Um, beyond this, we have a very large group of entrepreneurs and residents um, co-located with us here in Cambridge that help us launch and do the work of launching um, you know, six plus companies a year. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't highlight that that group is an incredibly talented and great part of the overall Atlas story. Roughly 40 or so entrepreneurs co-locate with us here in Cambridge. And so that's the expanded Atlas family, but importantly, the Atlas family is expanding. Um, we've had um, a lot of um, babies come and join the Atlas family over the last year, and this is a great thing to highlight. Um, these are five of the new uh, um, future associates at the firm and uh, really thrilled for our colleagues who've been expanding their own families. And so to conclude then, um, looking forward to 2020, we are actually moving offices to the nearby building in, uh, in Tech Square. This will give us about 50% more square footage for um, building and launching companies and expanding our incubation space. We're actively deploying capital in new deals and expect three to four of these to launch over the next few months. And then in terms of funds, we're deploying our 11th fund and the Opportunity Fund right now, and we'll likely contemplate future financings and fundraisings um, based on pace in the next 12 to 18 months. And so that's a wrap on the Atlas update across uh, uh, 2019. It's been a pleasure to share with you the overall Atlas year in review. Thank you very much for uh, your attention.